You've all been asking for it, and here it is finally, a video on the all-new fifth-generation Land Rover Discovery. This one is a 2019 model. For this generation Discovery, Land Rover decided to go in a different direction than previous generation models. This is an awful lot less square, an awful lot more aerodynamic, and it's now made of aluminum, just like the closely related Range Rover Sport. Up front we find full LED headlamp modules and you'll see that the overall design theme is a little bit more in keeping with the Range Rover line within the Land Rover umbrella than the previous generation Discovery. Overall it's a very attractive look but it also is a little restrained, a little bit more restrained than we see in something like a Mercedes-Benz G-Wagon in some ways. Now there are two different Discovery models in the Land Rover lineup. There's the Discovery that we're talking about right here, and then there's the Discovery Sport. The two vehicles are not related at all other than the Discovery name. This Discovery is a rear-wheel drive based vehicle with a longitudinal engine. It's related to the Range Rover Velar and the Range Rover Sport and a number of other Jaguar Land Rover rear-wheel drive products. The Discovery Sport is a front-wheel drive based crossover, although again all-wheel drive is what we find on that one as well. It's more closely related to the Range Rover Evoque and the Jaguar E-Pace, so they're two very different vehicles. The Discovery Sport is a compact two-row vehicle. This is considered a mid-size two- or three-row vehicle in America. Whether you want to call this a crossover or an SUV is entirely up to you. By the strictest definition of these terms, you could call the Land Rover Discovery a crossover, but you could also call it an SUV, and that's generally what Land Rover prefers that you call it. This is available as either a two-row or a three-row vehicle. This is about five inches longer than a Range Rover Sport, which also has an available third row, and you'll notice the difference between this and that Range Rover right back there in the third row area where we get a little bit more room in the Discovery. In terms of overall size, this is a little bit below the Audi Q7, but it definitely is accommodating compared to some of those smaller three-row options in America. Moving to the rear, you'll definitely notice how vertical this hatch is. That's a hallmark that we find in a lot of three-row vehicles out there. But you'll also notice how large the overhang is in this generation of Discovery as well. They have maintained their offset license plate design. Some people are a little bit upset at this asymmetricality back here, but it has been a distinctive feature of the Discovery name for some time. You'll find the release for the hatch right there above the license plate. For 2019, the Discovery comes with some active safety technology standard, but most of what you see on your screen are optional. We do get low speed range autonomous braking in this vehicle, lane keeping assistance and parking sensors standard, but things like blind spot monitoring, radar adaptive cruise control, full speed range autonomous braking, those systems are optional. At the moment, there are two different 3.0-liter V6 engines available under this hood in America. There's a 3.0-liter turbo diesel that produces 254 horsepower and 443 pound-feet of torque. It'll get you 23 miles per gallon. Then we have this gasoline engine right here. It's a 3.0-liter supercharged V6 producing 340 horsepower and 332 pound-feet of torque. Fuel economy for this one drops down to 18 miles per gallon. All Discoveries come with an 8-speed automatic transmission and standard 4-wheel drive, but the 2-speed transfer case and rear locker that we see on this model are optional. In an interesting twist, if you want the best towing capacity, you'll want the gasoline engine, not the diesel. This will give you 8,201 pounds of towing capability, the diesel 7,716. In other world markets, we do find some of Jaguar Land Rover's latest Ingenium series of engines available under this hood, but in America at the moment, we just get these two different V6s. In addition to the optional two-speed transfer case and the rear locker, we also have an adaptive air suspension available, and that's what this model has on it right now. If you don't get the air suspension, then ground clearance comes in at 8.4 inches. If you do get the air suspension, then you can get up to 11.1, and this is in the highest ride height mode at the moment. It will lower itself down to 8.1 to improve overall efficiency, and regular ride height mode is somewhere in between. Regardless of which version you get, Land Rover tells us that this is capable of fording 33.5 inches of water, which is a pretty good number as far as luxury SUVs go. When it comes to front seat comfort, I'm going to give these seats 8 out of 10 points. Remember that the luxury segment is full of some very, very comfortable seats. These seats do offer an inflatable side bolster feature. We also have four-way adjustable lumbar support and an available seat massage in addition to seat heating and seat ventilation. But at least for my body shape, I found the seats in the new BMW X7 a little bit more comfortable than this. And in many ways, the X7 and the Discovery are unlikely competitors. The X7 was designed to be a larger vehicle than the X5. This is about X5 sized. But the rumor mill tells us that the X5 is soon to be losing its third row, and we still have one in the Discovery. Hopping into the rear seat, we find a little bit less legroom in the two-row version of the Discovery than we find in a lot of its two-row competition, like the BMW X5, the GLE RX Q8, etc. at 76.7 inches of combined legroom. 
But if we hop up into the three row version, which is what we're driving this week, then overall combined legroom for the three rows put together is pretty competitive with the X7, XC90, and Q7. The difference here seems to be that the third row is pretty accommodating as we're going to take a look at for a luxury vehicle in terms of overall legroom, but the second room is a little bit tighter. With this front seat adjusted for me at six feet tall, you can see I have about two to three inches of legroom left there that is a little bit less than we find in some of those other options. And if I scoot all the way over to the right side of the vehicle, my knees are almost touching the seat back. I can just barely fit my hand between them. These seats do feature a recline function. It's powered in this version, and we get a pretty decent recline as far as a luxury vehicle goes. And both rows of the back seats can be power folded from the touch screen up front or from the cargo area in the back. A practical touch here in the second row is that the middle seat position folds down on its own that will allow you to put large items right here into the vehicle. The second row also features a powered function for getting into the third row. There's a button right over here on the shoulder section. If I press and hold that, it'll tilt this seat forward. It manages the front seat position as well, moving it further forward and more upright. And then we can slide this forward as well. This is not quite as easy to use as some of the other mechanisms that we see in luxury three row vehicles, but it is fully automated. As I push it back into place, it puts the front seat back into place. It puts the second row back into place as well. Hopping back into the third row, we have a little bit more room back here than you might suspect otherwise. Thanks to the very square profile of the Discovery, if I lean my head back here, it's just barely touching this very final part of the ceiling. I could comfortably sit back here for quite some time. If I move these second row seats all the way back, they will automatically move back into place, and you'll see that I have about an inch and a half of overall legroom. So even though the second room is a little bit tighter than some of those other options out there, the third row is surprisingly generous. We have a little bit more combined legroom in the Discovery than even something like the current generation Cadillac Escalade. Admittedly, it is just one inch more, however. Some nice touches back here are the fact that we have air vents for the third row passengers, one on each side right there, and we have a padded armrest cover there and heated rear seats. Oddly though, this side sill is pretty high, so it seems a little bit awkward for me at six feet tall to put my arm up there. Children will definitely be finding themselves a little bit below that window height. The smaller amount of combined legroom front row and second row means that it's going to be a little bit trickier to put rear facing child seats in the back of a Discovery. For instance, with this front seat adjusted for me at six feet tall, I just don't have enough room to properly install this rear facing child seat. It's obviously not latched into place because it is not at the right angle that you would need to install a rear facing child seat in this vehicle in. Now, because of the width of the Discovery, I could move it over here to the center position and properly install one of them, but you'd have troubles fitting two across the back. The Discovery doesn't give us a split liftgate and tailgate arrangement like we see in BMW's crossovers, but we do have this little shelf right here that is powered in an up-down motion right like that that will help keep cargo from falling out behind the third row seat. Admittedly, that's not going to be a lot of cargo because we don't find very much cargo room behind the third row, just over six cubic feet. If I fold the third row seats down, which I can do via buttons right here, then we'll get 38.8 cubic feet of storage space. That was enough to put eight 24 inch roller bags back here. We could not fit any 24 inch roller bags behind the third row with them in place. You can also power fold the second row seats from buttons right back here making this a pretty practical cargo area. If you get the five passenger version of the Discovery, then cargo capacity goes up to 45 cubic feet from the 38 we see in this model. As we look around the interior, keep in mind that the Discovery that we're looking at today is nearly a fully loaded model. We have a dual pane panoramic moonroof in this vehicle, one right there over the third row passengers, and then interestingly enough, one right over here for the first row. The second row passengers can sort of look out the one from the first row, but there's really nothing right above their heads. Folks up front get fixed height shoulder belts. We have two way electrically adjustable headrests and these feature this butterfly section right up front. The bolstering on the seat back and bottom cushion is moderately aggressive. This is electrically adjustable in this particular vehicle and the seat center sections are perforated because these seats are both ventilated and heated. Moving over to the front doors, there's a modern and minimalist design going on. We do have a section of real wood trim right there, just above that armrest, door handle right there, speaker grills, and then they put the window switch right there on top of the door. The minimalist design theme continues as we move on over to the dashboard. We have a dual glove box set up here, so there's one up top. I press a button there and pull it down. It's a slot style compartment with a 12 volt power port. And then we have a more traditional bin style glove compartment below it. I was not able to fit any of the larger tablet computers in either of these two compartments. The dash components are all soft touch materials. And there's a decent amount of stitching going on. There's also a ribbon of real wood up there above that glove compartment. 
Moving over to the center of the dashboard, we find a touchscreen infotainment system here. This supports the latest in smartphone integration. If we move back to the native Land Rover interface, you'll notice that the interface is basically the same interface that we've seen in JLR products for a while. Versus some of the German options, the system can be a little bit laggy. You'll notice that moving around the screens is pretty easy, but when we click on certain options, it takes a little while for things to load. The system is not quite as snappy as some of the German options out there, but overall interacting with the system is a little bit snappier than Land Rover products of the past. This model has a 360 degree camera system, but it's not activated automatically when you put it in reverse and then put it in drive as some of the other vehicles in this segment are. In an interesting touch, you can control the rear seat heating and ventilation from the touch screen up front, but I cannot control the third row for some reason from the front, even though the third row in this vehicle is also heated. And then these buttons down here refer to the headrest fold for the rear rows, and then this button right here will completely fold all those seats in the back. I can click that button right there, fold all or unfold all. Below that infotainment screen, we find the controls for the front two climate control zones. This does have a four zone climate control system. So you control the front two here and then the rest through the infotainment system or the controls in the back. We then have a storage compartment right there, 12 volt power port, and then the rotary shifter that we've seen in Jaguar and Land Rover products for a while. Behind that, we have the Land Rover terrain management knob. When the button is down, it's in auto mode. If I click it, it pops up and then I can rotate through the various modes comfort, grass, gravel, snow, mud ruts, sand, rock crawling, etc. The button to activate the low ratio mode is right over there. Hill descent control right over here. Below that we have the button for the stability and traction control system, a button for all terrain progress control, buttons to control the height of the suspension system. We can put it in high height mode, normal height mode, or access height mode. And then we have a button to enable or disable the auto start stop system. To the right of the button bank, we have two pretty decently sized cup holders. These were easily able to accommodate large takeout drinks. And then there's a removable liner right there in the cup holders, so that way they can accommodate even larger cups. Between the front seats, we have a padded storage area. This opens to reveal two tiers of storage. We have one where you can put some smaller smartphones. Larger ones will not fit. Definitely if they have a USB plug connected to them at time, they're not gonna fit there. This is also where we find the micro SIM for the infotainment system, those two USB input ports, and a 12 volt power port. This is a pretty deep storage area and I was just barely able to fit a gallon of milk inside. In addition to this padded armrest area, there are independent armrests on each of the front seats. This is something that we've seen from Land Rover for a while. There's a little knob right up front. That's how you adjust the height of the armrest. Over on the driver's side, we have a full LCD configurable instrument cluster. You can choose what you wanna see here, whether you wanna see two dials or just the one dial that we have in the middle or no dials at all and a larger segment for each of the various functions that this display can give you. For instance, we have a moving map display in this particular layout on the right and then the status of the vehicle's four wheel drive system over here on the left, including status of the locking rear and center couplings. This display is definitely attractive and it does feature active traffic information over here on the moving map display, but it's not quite as configurable and not quite as feature rich as the displays we see in some of the competition. So you'll never see, for instance, satellite imagery overlays on this particular display like we will see in some of the Audi products. The steering wheel is a round four spoke design. We have paddle shifters on the back, up on the right, and then down on the left. The buttons take a little bit of getting used to. Over here on the left side, we have a touch sensitive toggle for volume. So we can slide it up and down just as we saw in some Honda products before, or you can click up or click down on that control as well. The track forward backward options are over here on the right, but this is not touch sensitive in the same way. You have to click for those. Menu refers to the menu to control that multifunction LCD. So if I click that right there to hit menu, this turns into a four way joystick button with an okay to enter right in the middle. Below that, we have a favorite button, phone button, voice command button, and then on the right side of the steering wheel, we have the controls for the radar adaptive cruise control, along with a speed limit function, heated steering wheel button, and then a lane keep assist button. What takes some getting used to is that these buttons are touch sensitive buttons, but the whole button bank module moves to give you some haptic feedback. So for instance, if I just keep clicking on this corner of this module, it's not gonna turn the heated steering wheel on until I click right on that particular option, then you'll see that it activated. Similarly, if I click up here, it's not gonna turn the lane keep assist on, but if I click and then touch that option right there at the same time, it's gonna do that. Same with the speed limiter function right down there. 
Out on the road, 0 to 60 happens in 7 seconds in this supercharged model. That is significantly slower than the BMW X5 we last reviewed, and a little bit slower than the Audi Q7 as well. I think some of that has to do with the way that this ZF 8-speed automatic transmission has been programmed. Some of it could have to do with the overall curb weight, thanks to the 2-speed transfer case that we have here, and of course the gear ratios involved as well. This 8-speed transmission is theoretically the same unit that we see in the Q7 and the BMW X5, but it's just not as willing to change gear ratios as we find it in the BMW, for instance. In our 60 to 0 braking test, this model stopped in 134 feet, which is a little bit on the long side for this segment. I think that has to do with the overall tire size that we find in this versus some of the performance and wider tires that we see in the competition. When it comes to overall handling, I'm going to give this model a B. That does improve slightly if you get the regular steel spring suspension. I find that that one has a slightly more polished feel overall out on the road than the model equipped with the air suspension as ours is here. The air suspension does help improve the ride a little bit, but even when it comes to the overall ride dynamics, I think I still prefer this with the coil spring suspension. The air suspension definitely allows a little bit more tip and dive and a little bit more body roll overall, especially when the road starts curving like it is here. On a trail like we're driving on right here, you won't really get too much benefit out of the optional two-speed transfer case that this model has, but you really will tell the difference between this and the next trims in the lineup because of that locking differential in the rear. And the way that Land Rover chooses to do locking differentials is a little bit different than some of the other manufacturers out there because this axle doesn't just have an on-off lock function, they have a clutch pack back there that can allow different levels of lock effectively. And you'll see that on one of the camera views on your screen. You can see that, for instance, right now the center coupling is completely locked as we're going up this hill, but because we're turning slightly, the rear locker had been disengaged. And now that we're going straight, everything is fully locked to give us the optimum in traction. That's a feature that we don't find in a lot of less expensive off-road vehicles. A lot of those other vehicles will just lock things all the time. They won't allow that unlock and lock feature as you're doing different things with the steering wheel. There's a reason for that. Depending on your situation, you can end up losing traction and having a little bit less precision and a little bit less control if you had those lockers engaged all the time. That's one of the reasons that we don't see front locking differentials in too many vehicles out there because front lockers have a lot more limited use cases than rear locking differentials. If you were in a vehicle that had all three differentials completely locked and you were, for instance, trying to crab around a hill on a big rock, you wouldn't be going in as straight of a line as you would if you had disengaged the front locker, for instance. When I put the transfer case into low ratio mode, you'll notice that the display over there on one side of your screen will also start showing us wheel articulation in addition to the drive line settings. So you can see how far the wheels are extended front and rear. But again, the reality is that for the vast majority of driving situations, even when you're getting off the beaten path, just putting this Range Rover in auto mode, leaving it in drive, and leaving it in the high ratio mode is going to be just fine. Because all the systems in this vehicle are working together to give you the optimum in traction regardless of the situation going on outside. The other thing you'll really notice out on the trail is the overall suspension comfort. We are in the high ride height mode, but this is an awful lot more livable than the high ride height mode in something like a Jeep Grand Cherokee, which also has an adaptive air suspension. The reason for that is that Land Rover is not pushing these air springs quite as far as Jeep does in the Grand Cherokee, even though we're getting very similar overall ground clearance numbers, over 11 inches in this model. This has to do with the way that air suspensions work. When air suspensions are at either extreme, either their most extended or their least extended for highest ground clearance or lowest ground clearance, they're pushing the suspension geometry to either end of its overall range. And you don't have as much suspension movement in either the low suspension mode or the high suspension mode as you would right there in the middle. But here in the Land Rover at its highest suspension setting, we still have more suspension movement available than we see in the Jeep, and that yields a much more comfortable ride. If I were shopping for Discovery, I think I would get the regular coil spring suspension, simply because we haven't needed the extra ground clearance for anything that we've done out here today. And I don't think that most people buying a Land Rover Discovery are really going to be taking it anywhere that you're gonna need that extra level of clearance. And the big deal here is that if you can get away with the coil spring suspension, it's going to be cheaper to maintain in the long run, and it's going to give you, I think, a slightly more polished ride out on the road. 
In our cabin noise test, we clocked 72 decibels in here. I think that may have to do with the fact that the tires on this particular model seem to have perhaps a little bit of a balance issue. There's definitely a little bit of tire noise that I didn't expect in here and that we also did not see in a dealer provided model. So I'm going to have to give this an A minus there, but I'm going to put a little asterisk next to it because I don't know if that's a real number for the discovery. Hopefully we will be able to retest this after Jaguar Land Rover has taken this back, uh, check the tires, check to make sure that there's nothing wrong with them and perhaps we'll be able to get our hands on it again. But at the moment, 72 decibels is our score here. That compares to 69 in the BMW X5. Versus some of those European options out there, you'll definitely notice the supercharger noise. If you listen closely, you can really hear that additional whine going on under the hood. Personally, I find that enjoyable, but I do know that some people dislike the way that that sounds. So keep that in mind if you're cross shopping this with those other options. Overall fuel economy has been a little bit disappointing with this supercharged engine. That's something that we've seen in other Land Rover products that also use the three liter supercharged V6. We've been averaging about 17 miles per gallon over a week of mixed driving, which is below the EPA score for this engine and definitely below the averages that we've seen in competitive three row crossovers in the luxury segment. If you get the diesel engine, then you will get much better fuel economy. In the Land Rover models that we've driven with the three liter turbo diesel, those have typically gotten above the EPA overall as if you want better efficiency in your discovery, there is that three liter turbo diesel engine available. In Range Rover and Land Rover models that we've driven in the past with that engine, they've typically scored above overall EPA estimates. So I would expect that that model would probably get around 25 or 26 miles per gallon in mixed driving in a real world environment. You should probably also expect about 30 miles per gallon or so overall if you're just driving that out on the open highway. But if you want the best zero to 60 performance and interestingly enough, the best towing performance, then you're gonna want this supercharged engine right here. Generally speaking, supercharged engines aren't as efficient as turbocharged engines just by their very nature. And that's likely what's going on with this model versus something like the BMW X5. Overall, I really like the Discovery out on the road. I've long had a soft spot for Land Rover and Range Rover products, and some of that is probably at play here. I've also owned two Jaguars in the past, and there's something very familiar about the user interface, just the way that the vehicle feels overall out on the road. But I have to say that I do find the way that the engine and the transmission have been programmed to be a little bit disappointing. This just doesn't feel as peppy as something like the BMW X5 or the BMW X7 with their three liter engine. Moving the transmission over to the sport mode definitely helps sharpen things up and we get pretty decent response from the shift paddles on the back of the steering wheel. But again, overall responsiveness does appear to be a little bit below some of the German options. For 2019, the Discovery starts just under $53,000. That gets you the 340 horsepower supercharged V6. If you want the turbo diesel, that's going to be about two grand more expensive. This is one of the smaller turbo diesel bumps that we see in the luxury segment. So if you're really interested in a diesel SUV, this could be a good buy. It's also going to be one of the few diesel SUVs you'll be able to find in America at this time. A lot of the European manufacturers have really moved away from diesel, but we still see this option in the Discovery. It's very likely that we'll soon be able to get the nearly 400 horsepower tune of the inline six engine that they've been developing for their Jaguar Land Rover products. We don't know exactly when that's coming to the discovery. Land Rover makes a number of different three row vehicles in this segment. So comparisons tend to be a little bit tricky when you're trying to decide which vehicle you should compare to what. The Discovery is definitely a BMW X5 alternative, but then quite logically so would a Range Rover Sport or perhaps a Range Rover Velar, I suppose you could also put in that same segment. At $60,700, the X5 is going to be a little bit more expensive than the Discovery, so the Discovery could be considered a value alternative to that. But if we take a look at the next segment down, the mainstream segment, the Land Rover definitely has a more premium interior and a more premium price tag than something along the lines of a Dodge Durango or a Ford Explorer. So it's definitely in a different category than those, but it may not necessarily be in the same category as a BMW X5, depending on exactly how you have them equipped. The X5 is definitely going to be faster than the base version of the Discovery, and we can get a twin turbo V8 in that X5 at the moment as well. And if you want more power in your Land Rover, you'll have to move out of the Discovery into something like that Range Rover Sport. With this generation of X5, they've really spent a lot of time making the interior more comfortable and more premium. And that's really obvious when you compare it to the Land Rover Discovery. Again, I think the Land Rover does a 
really good job when it comes to interior refinement, but it's not that same level that we find in the BMW. Although again, keep in mind that its price tag is lower. The Discovery also gives us a little bit more personality than we see in the BMW X5. And that's definitely one reason that you might want to select it over some of the other options in this segment. I like the way that it's styled and I like the way the interior suits me. It just feels like a very comfortable place to spend your time. Before we move on, I should mention that the rumor mill is telling us the X5's third row is cancelled. It's been difficult to get confirmation on that exactly. Some folks are saying no, it's still available. Some folks are saying yes, it is definitely dead. Either way, know that the X5's third row is probably living on borrowed time now that the X7 is around. Next up, we have the Lincoln Aviator. This is definitely an interesting option here, and I think a very direct competitor to the Discovery. At this point in time, I haven't driven the Aviator, but I have driven the related Ford Explorer. So likely the Aviator is going to be very similar to that. But keep in mind, we haven't driven it yet. Overall, the Aviator appears to be a pretty good deal. We already know some pricing information on it, but stay tuned for our complete take on that just as soon as we can get our hands on that. But if you're shopping for Discovery now, you should definitely be looking at that Aviator just as soon as it's available on dealer lots. With that out of the way, let's move on to the GLE. The GLE is definitely more expensive than the base model of the Discovery, starting at $56,200. But if you want the really trick bouncing model, the one that you've seen with the air suspension that helps get it out of sand, etc., then that will be at least $72,000. $2,800 because you do need to get the e-active package on top of that and a bunch of other stuff as well. Feature for feature, the GLE is definitely going to be more expensive than the Discovery. That's again because in some ways the GLE is probably a more direct and more appropriate competitor to the Range Rover Sport. Next up, we have the Audi Q7. Keep in mind that the Q7 is getting a pretty significant update for 2020. It's getting an all new interior, a refreshed exterior, and a number of other mechanical tweaks as well. The interior styling is quite sedate. It definitely drives like a big family hauler. In many ways, the Volvo XC90 is gonna be the better handling option in that particular segment. But the Q7 is well-priced. It also is very roomy on the inside. Think of it sort of like the German minivan. Now we don't know what 2020 is going to hold for the Q7, but I wouldn't be surprised if the Q7 got more expensive and a lot more comfortable. It definitely looks like Audi is going in a different direction with the Q7 now, bringing it more in line with what we see in the A8 and the Q8 in terms of overall interior design and probably interior refinement and comfort as well. But we won't know until we can get our hands on one, hopefully over the next few months here. That brings us along to the Volvo XC90, an interesting and definitely direct competitor to the Discovery. In terms of overall price, there is definitely overlap between the XC90 and the Discovery, but they're two very different vehicles. The Discovery definitely is focusing on off-road ability, the XC90 on on-road ability. They also take a different approach to overall performance. The XC90 starts with an awful lot less power at a lower price point, but it goes up to more power at a higher price point than we find in the Discovery. In some ways, the very top end trim of the Volvo is trying to compete with a Range Rover rather than the Discovery. Overall interior refinement is definitely better in the XC90, and although its infotainment system has received a few complaints, I think that overall it comes across as a little bit better thought out than what we see in the Land Rover and a little bit easier to use as well. Volvo offers an adaptive air suspension in the XC90, but it doesn't behave quite the same way as what we see in the Discovery either. Again, it's definitely more focused towards its on-road mission. The Discovery is more focused to the off-road mission. And that's one of the reasons that depending on exactly what you're doing, the XC90 can end up feeling a little bit more stable and actually handle a little bit better than some comparably priced Discovery models. If I was shopping in this segment, what would be my top pick? Well, that really would depend on exactly what I'm looking for. If I'm looking for the newest and most interesting entry at the moment, I have to say that's probably going to be the Lincoln Aviator. Although again, I haven't driven that model just yet. I'm also particularly interested in the updated Q7 for 2020, because it really looks like Audi's gonna be turning over a new leaf on that model. Obviously the BMW X5 and the Mercedes GLE are going to be solid, safe options here. I really, really like the way the X5 is put together in this generation, but if you're looking for something that's more off-road capable, definitely more off-road focused, then that's definitely going to be the Land Rover Discovery. Even though Land Rover has put an awful lot more emphasis on on-road driving ability with this generation of the Discovery, it is still one of the most capable off-road three-row crossovers you can buy. 
Thanks to its overall interior design, high value, and a relatively affordable plug-in hybrid system, I have to say that my top pick in this particular segment at the moment continues to be the Volvo XC90. But again, there are definitely some logical reasons to pick some of the competition, and I think in this segment, there really are no losers at the moment. There are some reasons that I wouldn't want to get the current generation Q7, but I think that the 2020 Q7 is going to fix a lot of the things that I find wrong with it. And again, definitely look at the X5, the GLE, the Aviator, and even the Land Rover Discovery discovery, depending on exactly what you're looking for in your next three row crossover. Be sure to let me know what you think about all that down there in the comment section below. Also be sure and find us over at facebook.com slash so you can see what we're driving this week. I'll see you later.